Welcome, RTO superheroes, to another episode of our podcast. Today we have a special episode where the tables are turned. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Lauren Hollows. Lauren is an educational visionary and a passionate advocate for building better education systems and services. She is the founder of Anywhere Education Services, and she's dedicated to providing quality, compliant, and accessible assessment tools to educators. With a wealth of experience in business coaching, team development, resource development, and RTO compliance, Lauren excels at identifying ways to improve and streamline processes within the educational sector. She is passionate about using education to make a difference, fostering staff engagement, and enhancing business maturity. Lauren is also the driving force behind Learning Lifelines, a not-for-profit organisation aimed at closing the digital divide and providing equal education and economic opportunities. She believes in the transformative power of education. Today, Lauren will be wearing the interviewer's hat and will be asking me about some of the exciting developments and challenges in the vet sector. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hey guys, my name is Lauren Hollows and we are continuing our RTO Standards Series, getting into the weeds today with Katya from Hawkeye Consultancy and Angela from Vivacity. Katya, please introduce yourselves to our audience. Hi everyone, um, as Lauren mentioned, I am Katya Holker. I am from Hawkeye Consultancy. Hawkeye Consultancy was established in 2017. Um, we're based here on the Gold Coast, where I am now, not so sunny today. Um, and we offer a range of different services um, to RTOs and universities. Anything from due diligence packages, change of ownership, and um, validation, um, professional development workshops, so this goes on. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here to join you, ladies. Good. And Angela. Hi, I'm Angela Connell Richards. I am the owner and director of Vivacity Coaching and Consulting. We've been helping training organisations to get compliance, save time and save money since 2009. And we've been working in a range of areas, including initial registration, addition to scope uh, and ongoing registration requirements and been diving into these new standards. So, and I'm loving this series, Lauren. All right, so today we are going a little bit, something a little bit different. Um, we are talking about some of the new requirements for governance within RTOs, um, and specifically we're talking about the leadership of the RTO. So this is actually something that is, I'm going to argue is completely new. People can disagree with me, that's fine. Um, but leadership is effective in building and promoting a positive organisational culture. The RTO demonstrates the governing persons to foster an inclusive organisational culture where diversity is recognised, ensure integrity, fairness and transparency in the delivery of services, ensure cultural safety for First Nations staff and learners, and protect learners and staff from harassment and discrimination. So I think this is really, it's a very interesting standard. I think there's so many keywords in this. Um, I just want to start by getting your guys kind of just general initial thoughts on the standard, what you thought when you first read it. Um, so, Angela, let's start with you. Okay. It reminded me a lot of the old framework that we had uh, many, many years ago before ASQA so, and before we got the legislation. And the framework had a lot of information in there about diversity, uh, ethics, integrity, all of that. That that were that was back then a requirement to have in our policies and procedures. And then it got taken away with the legislation. So uh, when we had the new standards uh, implemented, so for me it reminded me a lot of you know going back in time. What we used to have, we had my RTO, um, and we had to have those in our policies and procedures. 
Um, it's also interesting to see that they've brought First Nations in uh, when we consider a lot of legislation has changed in a lot of different areas and, and people would know that through a lot of the training products where there are now uh, Aboriginal uh, Torres Strait Islander units that are within different training products. So I, I think it's good that they've brought that in as part of the legislation. And then NDIS and disabilities and making sure that we're covering those those areas as well. So yes, it's something new from these standards, but it does take me back in time. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Katya, what were your first thoughts? Um, I thought, yeah, I, I, I welcomed it. To be honest, I did think it potentially might be a bit hard for organisations to properly implement. And um, when I look at leadership or think of leadership, it always starts from the top and it seeps its way down. Um, and just in some of my, I suppose, ongoing relationships with some more TOs, the CEO isn't necessarily at the operational level, like all of the, the staff who undertake the um, you know, day-to-day -day operations of the RTO. So I thought, oh, that might be a bit tricky. Um, not that it's not important, but it will be a bit tricky, potentially manage. Um, and, and look, they sign off a declaration each year. They should be aware of the standards and what the implications are. But they suppose the, the nitty gritty. Um, I, I thought that might be a little bit difficult um, to even just evident. Like, how do we, how are we going to evident these things um, when it comes to an audit? Um, but yeah, I definitely really liked around the, the First Nations and the inclusion of that. As Angela mentioned, there's a lot of shift towards including that in legislation, which was good. Um, anything around harassment and discrimination too, I, I definitely welcomed that too. There was nothing really there. And I know that some providers were including it in, you know, you know, they might have sexual harassment um, or anti-bullying discrimination policies. And um, so, but I think to actually legislate it and make, you know, providers have to do it is probably really good. It's going to safeguard our um, staff and learners. So, yeah, I, I welcome most of it, but there are some areas I think it definitely needs to, yeah, maybe give a bit more guidance as to what they want to see um how can people ensure integrity and what does that look like and um, to ensure consistency as well one providers what they think is integrity might be completely different um to another provider so i think that probably just needs to be streamlined a bit or more provided just given i think yeah, the I other major change is going to be the cultural awareness training that you're going mm. to need to implement within the rto I think that's going to depend a lot on the training packages and the cohorts that a lot of people deal with. Um, you know, I think that that's going to become a, a big component of it. I think this is one of those interesting standards because, um, you know, very similar to, to many other areas of the standards, I think everyone looks at that and goes, there's nothing in there I disagree with, right? I, I absolutely agree that we should foster um, inclusive cultures. We should be, we should have integrity. We should be transparent. We should be fair. We should ensure cultural safety. We should protect our staff. Um, I think the question is, is that beyond a policy, how do we evidence this? Um, mm. You know, and I think this is one of where, where we get to some of these particular areas. This is where I always find it, I think for a lot of RTOs, I think they find it really challenging to understand what does this mean beyond a policy, right? So, you know, um, I want to just start, like, let's just break these down one at a time. So foster an, an inclusive organisational culture where diversity is recognised. Now, we're going to have access and equity policies. Uh, you know, we're going to have disability access and inclusion plans. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have a policy that says we foster an organisational culture. Beyond that policy, what does this look like? for an RTO to be able to demonstrate that the governing persons are doing this? Mm. Should I start or until do you want to go? Yeah, I've got thoughts on it. So I think um, one is going to be changing the position description requirements of CEO and senior management within the RTO to make sure that not only there is a diversity and inclusive uh, policy and procedure, but they're implementing it. And what does that procedure look like? What would be part of that process? 
And one of the things that our team identified when we did the pilot program was a cultural awareness training. So implementing a cultural awareness training for staff and governing persons to enhance their understanding and appreciation of diversity. Uh, and that's what we saw in there. Um, not only uh, cultural awareness training for their existing team, but incorporating that into their induction process, not only for their staff, but also for their students. Mm. And I think what's really important, the training is, it's good that you're doing it at the start, but then is there any guides or any further documentation that can actually assist um staff to continue with that mm. a lot of times they could read it something you know that they, they they read it and then it, it's forgotten about or they have provided training and they might not you know they might not remember the importance of it so is there any follow-up process or any guidance or networking opportunities for um staff to just kind of refresh that as they go mm. on i think is really important too but i definitely agree with angela's suggestions in terms of cultural um training very important but then having that extra layer of also making sure there's additional support mechanisms there for them to I don't know if you I think see this look in very the different thing. across you know different rtos you know what i mean like if this is mm -hmm. going to look very different in our tradie rtos then it is going to look in our you know um, our community services rtos where you know some of these concepts and some of this terminology may already be a little bit more embedded within like the organizations mm. that they're working with. Um, mm. I think within some of our tradie sectors, that's probably where some of the stuff is going to be a little bit more challenging. Challenging mm. to uh, management and staff and most probably even to students. Absolutely. And the potential right, cool. for additional resources too. There's smaller providers there. Is this going to be an additional cost that they need to factor in? Um, we undertook a cultural training one day and it, you know, it was a two thousand dollars for our team. Like there's some providers that may not potentially have um the fees available to be able to spend that. And um, so they probably need to be aware of that. And that's where it's very important that it is suited to each of the different um providers out there. Thank you for joining us at the RTO Superhero Podcast with me, Angela Connell-Richards. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Each rating and review helps me fulfil my goal of helping training organisations around Australia to learn and grow in compliance and business success.